Psalm 46, beginning there, and then also I'd have you turn your attention to 2 Kings, and 2 Kings chapter number 18, and just make a few notes of reference for this introduction to this particular message and uh, this month's uh, teaching. And so, <clears throat> as you know, the theme is Be Still and Know That I Am God. As we focus on this this year, from time to time we'll bring this back out, we'll accentuate it, but for the most part it'll be on your own. You'll see the banners and you'll see it on different uh, forms of uh, uh, advertisement. Uh, but we want you to be able to focus your attention on growing uh, in your trust in God. And that's why the book that was given out, those meditations on stress less, trust more, uh, oftentimes I find that Christians are good at being cliché. Uh, we know the verses, and we can even quote them. If somebody's going through a hard time, you'll, we'll say something like, well, you know, you just need to trust God more. Uh, then when it's our turn, we're thinking, how do I get through this? I don't know how to deal with this. This is, this is crazy. I mean, nobody's ever been through what I'm going through. And, uh, and so sometimes uh, we, the irony of that is we can give out good advice, but then when we go through it, we realize, okay, this is a whole different thing living it than just offering up a cliche verse from here to there. And so what does it mean to trust God? What does it uh, do for us? And I want to set the background to this particular psalm. The best we can tell, commentators uh, have agreed, and of course you always find some that don't agree fully, but uh, what we have found uh, in the studies of uh, looking at portions of Scripture the Psalms many times are a response, whether it be from David or from another writer of the Psalm, uh, either to a great trial of affliction that they have been through, crying out to God for help and deliverance, or uh, just extolling the great magnitude of our God and praising Him for His creation, praising Him for His wonders. And as you read through the Psalms, it really should be something that sh should be common for you as a Christian to, to read through, at least get familiar with some of the Psalms. And there's great books written on the explanation behind each Psalm. And we don't know all the details necessarily. But as I give you this opening introduction to this, Many commentators do agree that this psalm was written as a response to a particular event that took place in the nation of Israel's history. And that is why I had you reference 2 Kings in chapter number 18. Again, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, the, uh, the, the books of uh, Samuel and Kings Chronicles uh, give us really what was taking place in certain kingdoms. It gives us a list of kings that served the nation of Israel, and then we have the divided kingdom, and it gives you some more of the details and some different stories that have taken place. But uh, much of it is written in order for us to understand uh, how God dealt with mankind during those times of conflict and trials and blessing. And so we go back to 2 Kings chapter 18. I want you to just note here that at the time, if this is true, and, and we believe it is, that this psalm was written in response to this particular event. And what was this event? Well, uh, Sennacherib, who was uh, a leader of a, a great army, the Assyrians, were now have marched against Israel, and they are standing outside of Israel, and they are ready to take over Israel, to capture them. They've already taken 46 different cities around Judah, based on their own uh, declaration. And now they are at the walls of Jerusalem, ready to take over Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah, who was a good king, as you read the description about Hezekiah, he, he loved God, he honored God, he tried to come up with some ways of getting the people to, to honor God again with their life. And now he is faced with this great challenge. Can you imagine having a couple hundred thousand soldiers outside of your city gates saying, we're coming to get you? And this is the setting, and, and, and this is the understanding of what we get from studying the Scriptures. And so 2 Kings 18, really beginning in verse number 13 through chapter number 19, is, is where you'll find that. And I don't have time uh, to, to dive into this, but I just want to give you kind of the setting. So when we read Psalm 46, you understand more of why were these things said? Who is saying these things and what do they mean and, and what should they understand by those things that were stated in this particular psalm? Now, I know that we have military personnel and, and mostly in our community. Uh, our guys are not on the front lines as far as on land battle, but they are underway and, and some of our guys have been involved with different conflicts. Uh, but we recognize that if you're in a situation of hand-to-hand -hand battle and hand-to-hand -hand conflict, that's a whole other world of battle. And this is what it was like back in their day. And here to have people who 
were trying to honor God with their lives, but now met with this great difficulty of saying, look, we're living for God. We're trying to do what's right in our God's eyes. And now we have a couple hundred thousand uh, Syrians who are brutal military uh, personnel willing to come in and just basically take us captive, kill us, plunge us, plunder us. We've already tried to make concessions with the king of Assyria, and that's not worked. What do we do now? And the only place for them to turn is the best place for them to turn, and that is upward. Sometimes, and I'm guilty of this just as much as anybody else, if a problem comes to my life and I can handle it, then I'll work. Even if it means working a little extra, if it means you know, trying to figure things out, moving things around, I'm good. But when it comes to a problem that I have no control over, when it comes to an issue I have no control over, that's when it gets real for me. I don't know about you, but when things get out of our control, that's when it seems to get real. How do you deal with it? I don't know. And it forces us to our knees to, to go to a place of dependence on our God, or it forces us to show our true colors and we run from God. It's either the fight or, the, the fight or flight type of response sometimes when we come to these things. And so I want you to, 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 to note here, back in Psalm 46, three truths to meditate on. Three truths to meditate on. Because as Christians, many times we hurry about and at a worried pace trying to figure out how to solve our problems, but often we forget to look upwards. The three truths to meditate on here, I want you to notice here in verse number one, God is our, what's the word? Refuge. God is our refuge. You don't have to turn with me. I'll read it for you. But if you'd like to turn, Isaiah chapter 25 and verse number 4, just as a, a point of reference. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse number 4 states this. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the, the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. And here we have a reference, just kind of a cross-reference about God being our refuge. A refuge is a place of safety. A refuge is a place of solace. A refuge is a place that you can go to, to flee to, in order for you to find protection. But we recognize that Jerusalem, being the, the city that the Assyrians are now camped against... There was no place for them to go. They were walled up inside their city. If you know anything about history of battles, many times the, the, the people would be fleeing from the outskirts of the country back towards the city where the walls were and the gates were in order to find refuge in there. So that way that would be the last line of defense. If the enemy got inside those gates, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was battle, or it was just over. And so... This is where we, we see the people that they found out that all of Judah has been taken over, that many other cities have been conquered, and now Assyria is camped outside their gates, and they're actually mocking the God of Israel. The God who you trust in? Oh yeah, that God that you say you trust in? He's the one that sent me here. Can you imagine somebody coming to you and saying that to you about your God? Can you imagine someone taunting you and, and saying, yeah, where's your God now? And some of you as Christians have been through trials, you've been through struggles, and you may have someone who's a sarcastic non-believer say, oh yeah, what's it like for you now, Christian? How's it, how's, it, how's it for you now, Christian, going through this trial? Where's your God now? The sad part is some Christians ask themselves those questions. When we go through trials, and we go through circumstances that are not pleasant, and we go through financial reversal or relationship issues or... You know, God, I've been faithful in you. How could you let this happen to me? What did I do to, to bring your anger upon me, God? And you're totally missing sometimes what God has planned for you. The nation of Israel this time was actually having a little revival. They were getting their hearts right with God. So why now? Why would we go through this? We're doing right. What, what, why would you let my health deteriorate? Why would you let my family break apart? Why would you let this financial reversal come? And what we fail to see sometimes that God is working in us. Sometimes he allows things to come in our life 
but many times he's, he's allowing us to be used as a testimony or he is allowing us to go through testing in order to prove us, not to hurt us, but to help us to grow in a particular area of faith. And that doesn't answer every single person's uh, trial or conflict they've gone through. But we do know is that God wants us to flee to Him as our refuge. We can absolutely flee to God as a refuge. The second thing I want you to notice here says about these three truths to meditate on from this text is God is our strength. God is our strength. Notice what it says in Psalm 28, in verses 7 and 8. Psalm 28, verses 7 and 8 state this. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him and I helped, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise Him. The Lord is their strength, and He is their saving strength of His anointed. The thing that we must recognize is not only is God our refuge, but God is also the source of our strength. And let me add in this, for those who look to Him. It's one thing to say, well, I'm a Christian. You know, the nation of Israel said, we're God's people. But God still allowed the armies to camp right outside their gates saying, we're coming to get you. God may allow a health scare to come in your life. He may actually allow that health scare to come in your life and not go away because he may be using you for a ministry that you weren't prepared for. Some of you who have been through great losses are the best ones to now comfort somebody else. And I hate to say it that way, but maybe God is preparing you to minister to somebody else. And after your time of wondering and wandering and, and hurting and anger and healing, somebody else is going to go through the same thing. And you might be the very one that says, no, I know what you're going through. And along with the being mad at God and along with the struggling and along with your fleshly desires... It's worth it to stay faithful. It's worth it to come back to God because you're running from the wrong person. It doesn't get better when you go against Him. And only you who have been through these things would know how to minister to others that way. There are some things, even as pastor, I'm at a loss. I've not been through what some of you have been through, and the only thing I can do is offer the cliche verse. And sometimes I feel empty. I wish I know what to say to you. We've been through death of family members. We've been through, you know, I, I can go on with a list of many, many different things. And, but there's some things that I don't know. And, but there's others of you that God has prepared to be a minister to people that you may be the only one that can bring that, be that source of comfort. But the true source of comfort comes from God who is our refuge and who is our strength. The third truth to meditate upon is that God is our refuge, God is our strength. Thirdly, it's almost a statement of defiance. We will not fear. Do you see that in there? Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear? Notice what it says. Though the earth be removed, we're not going to fear. And though the mountains are carried in the midst of the sea. Now, I don't know about you. If I saw the earth removed, <laughs> and I saw the mountains going down to the sea, I'd be a little scared, just to be honest with you. I've seen the tsunamis, and I've seen the different earthquakes in the, in the aftermath. My wife and I have been in a number of earthquakes when we served in Southern California. It rattles you. I mean, yes, I, literally and physically, it rattles you. And you realize, man, this is out of our control. There is nothing you could do except look up. God, if this is what you want for us, if this is our end, then let us end well. But God, if you're going to spare us, guide us because we don't know how to deal with this. Going the other way, God, I can't believe you'd do this to me. I'm going to go back to my old ways and do what I want to do. And everyone that's gone that way, if they wake up and come back, say, I made it worse. It's no better. The truth to meditate, God is our refuge. God is our strength. 
we will not fear. But I want you to notice also what it says here in verse number one. He is what kind of help in trouble? A very present help in trouble. Do you know what we miss so often? When you're going through the hardest trial of your life, he is right there. But through the fog and through the hurt and through the shock and through the anger, we block him out. And he's right there. You could reach your arm out and say, God, I know you're here with me. I know I can't feel you. I know I can't see you. But please, let me know you're here with me. And I've been around some amazing Christians that have said, Pastor, can you sense him? So what are you talking about? He's here with me right now. I'm thinking, whew, what are you channeled into right now that I'm not? That's pretty powerful stuff when they know it and they said, no, he's here. That a pastor misses it. The source of all spiritual knowledge and you know, strength. <laughs> right. Come on, folks. When you go through things, he says, I'm right here. I've not left you. You know where God was when a couple hundred thousand Assyrians camped outside of Jerusalem? He was right there. Right there. You know where God is when you go through financial reversal? He's right there. You know where God is when your relationships break up? He's right there. You know where God, you, you fill in the what if, the, the, the thing. He is right there. He may have chosen you for something that he's not chosen me for. He may be putting you in a situation that he hopes that you're going to learn the lesson so that you can minister to somebody. Even though you say, but I didn't choose this type of test. I hear you. But he may be preparing you for use that you would say, I never would have picked it, but now that I've learned from it, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this service for my God. These truths to meditate on. God is our refuge. God is our strength. We will not fear. Why? He is a very present, evident help right now, right where I'm at, no matter where you are. The troubles in this present life, natural disasters. God said you're going to have them and you're going to have many more before he comes back. Do you realize that? The things that we see in the news, the tornadoes, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the, the craziness going... He said it's going to increase before he returns. Folks, we need to get used to this. This is the new day. This is not fatalism. This is just reality that God said it's going to happen. So prepare yourself. When somebody is rattled, another Christian, I can't believe it. God is so mean. No, he told us that this was going to happen. This is just part of what's going to happen because of a sin-cursed world. War. War. It's going to keep happening, folks. Health issues, it's going to keep happening. Relationships. Now, some of you can deal with these things, but some people are going to keep having relationship issues. Finances, enemies. You know, it's interesting that Martin Luther, who was a Reformation character, some of you may know of him, a priest who understood true salvation and was persecuted by the Catholic Church for not following their way, from this same text, wrote the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Song still in our songbooks, a, ver a song that's been an anthem down through the centuries. There was a gentleman who was trying to find out when did he actually write that song. And what he found out based on his study is that he wrote that song during a time where, where they were, they were in such severe plague, people were dropping, as they said, like flies all around them. And they said, please get out of there. We will take you somewhere safe, some, someplace healthier. He said, no, my family and I will stay and we will minister to these people. And they said, but you're going to die. And he said, that's in God's hands. Not his wife nor his children, not one of them contracted the plague and died. And they ministered faithfully. Even as the church was after him to persecute him for not standing with them in their doctrine. A mighty fortress is our God. 
I just want you to notice something. I'm going to close it down because we'll be on this chapter here for a little while. But I want you to draw your attention back down here to verse number 10. Be still and know, say it with me, that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We put up the be still because the first part of the statement, but what I really want, like for you to take away from you every time you see these two words, be still, is know that I am God. If you understand what's in that one statement, that He is God, what are His attributes? What are the qualities of our God? What are his abilities? What is his purpose and plan for humanity? And what is his purpose and plan for you? That should give you such confidence that no matter what you face, that you can be still and know that God is right there with you during this trial, during this struggle. Let me just make a couple statements. In stillness, you are not using your own strength. You are not relying on your own wisdom. You are not allowing your mind to focus on your own way of doing things. In stillness, you are trusting God, but that doesn't also mean that you are retreating. It doesn't mean that you're just taking it easy. Picture yourself again inside the walls of Jerusalem when the Assyrians are outside ready to come in and just wipe you out. These people were preparing for battle. While they were crying out to their God, they were still in prep mode. Knowing that sometimes God does intervene, sometimes God still expects us to go through the work. Being still should not be something that causes you to say, well, I'm just going to take it easy. I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to just go on a, a long extended vacation from God. No, that's not what he means at all. It means while you're going through the hustle and bustle of preparing and going through the tests and going through the trials, wait and understand that God is right there with you and he's not giving you permission to retreat. He's giving you the ability to stand and trust him during this time of trial. The stillness is a still mind and heart because your trust is fixed on a God who can do the impossible. Why is stillness important? Stillness is important because it causes you to observe things more clearly. Have you ever been trying to look through binoculars on a windy day? on a boat with two to three foot or five foot swells, John, you know very clearly. And you're doing one of these, you're like, you try to do this, you try to focus. It's almost impossible. What happens is you have to kind of get in the same motion. Somebody out looking at you is like, dude, is Pastor dancing over there? What's, <laughs> what's he doing? You know, what's going on? You have to learn to ride the waves. And things will come into focus because you're learning to sort of fight it, to go with it. And sometimes the stillness is trying to find that clarity. Okay, God, what's in this? Why are you allowing this? What do I need to focus on right now? And for some of us, we focus on everything. I gotta get all the information, I gotta get everything done, and we're fretting and we're fussing and we're worrying. And God just say, calm down. Just one thing at a time. And He can do that. If you look up, if you will take the time to instead of fretting and worrying and having all this, if you will just calm yourself. Say, okay, God, I know you're here with me. Give me the ability to focus. Give me that stillness to trust you. And I have so many more notes here, but when you're still, your heart rate decreases.
When you're still, it allows you to hear better. When you're still, it allows you to think clearer. And knowing that God is there adds great clarity in the stillness. There's two ways in which verse number 10 is used to send this message. Verse 10 could be understood from the person going through the trial. Don't be anxious. Wait on God. To the person causing the conflict, like the Assyrians, best for you to be still because you don't know what's coming next. And if you know the rest of the story in 2 Kings, God told Hezekiah, Hezekiah, don't fret, I've got this. And 185,000 men woke up dead the next morning. Never a sword lifted. God just took them out. And what they learn as they, the psalmist reflects and writes this song is, they learn to rest in God. Trust God. What they learned was to be still and know that He is God. Father, we thank you.